On this Tuesday night, a troubling question about one of Canada's most prolific serial killers. Could nurse Elizabeth Wetlofer have been stopped sooner? As an inquiry investigates her eight murders, documents reveal how she was able to practice for so long. Did a system designed to protect patients fail? Also tonight, we look at the legacy of Kate Spade and how she changed women's fashion. And an interview with Gloria Allred, the controversial lawyer at the center of the Me Too movement on battling some of the biggest names in Hollywood from Cosby to Weinstein. Women's voices matter. Tonight, she sits down with Rosie. This is The National. Elizabeth Wetlofer preyed on patients at seniors' homes over the course of years, killing eight, attempting to harm or kill six more. She confessed, and though she never revealed her motive, she's serving eight life sentences. Today, it was the system on trial, the opening of an inquiry into her actions. And as John Lancaster explains, already the evidence is startling. Friends and family of the victims want answers. Their frustration, clear. They want to see the people who are accountable be crucified in the public eye. How could Elizabeth Wetlofer's crimes go unchecked and unnoticed for a decade? No one would have suspected any type of foul play at all. And almost immediately came the bombshells. Documents reveal that Elizabeth Wetlofer, or Parker as she was then known, was a problem from the moment she became a nurse in 1995. Fired from her first nursing job for stealing, then overdosing on narcotics. The nurses' union intervened, and the firing was reduced to a voluntary resignation. By 2007, Wetlofer was working here at the Crescent Care Facility in Woodstock, Ontario. She would later admit to killing seven patients there, all with massive doses of insulin. Documents show Caressing Care reprimanded or suspended Wetlofer nine times for a litany of medical errors, patient abuse and incompetence, until finally the facility fired her in 2014. But once again, the Ontario Nurses Association, Wetlofer's union, intervened on her behalf. Her firing was again called a voluntary resignation, and Caressing Care, while they agreed to give Wetlofer a glowing letter of reference, and $2,000 in damages. The care facility did report Wetlofer to the College of Nurses of Ontario, but the licensing body took weeks to look into the matter and in the end decided to take no action. By then, Wetlofer was already caring for the sick and elderly again, this time at Meadow Park Care Facility in London, Ontario. That's where she has since admitted to killing 75-year-old Arpad Horvath. Laura Jackson was a friend of one of Wetlofer's eight victims. She says the system failed them all. It not only failed, it fell apart. And that's what put us in this position. We have to realize that we're the next ones going in. These people that are doing this inquiry, they're the next wave of people going into the nursing homes. So let's hope we get some serious change. Wetlofer went on to try to kill two more patients at other jobs as well. Every time I walked in after somebody who passed away, I always wondered if this day I'm going to get caught. Finally, in 2016, she confessed to police that she'd been on a decade-long run of crimes against the elderly. Another place where the system may have failed, on at least two occasions, the local coroner was told a patient's death may not have been natural, yet no autopsies were ever performed. John Lancaster, CBC News, St. Thomas, Ontario. These documents raise questions about the conduct of, among others, the Nurses Association of Ontario, but they told us they won't be answering any of those questions today, though they are expected to speak at the inquiry. Jay Medes is a lawyer with the Advocacy Centre for the Elderly and is at this inquiry representing long-term care residents. As you look through these documents, what is most striking to you? Well, I think what's most striking is the uh, number of places where things uh, could have been done better, but things went wrong. Uh, there wasn't enough oversight of Ms. Wetlofer in the home. Uh, the college was not giving the proper discipline. There were issues in the information that was going between homes when she changed jobs. And we see the coroner not investigating uh, deaths in long-term care that should have been investigated. And many of these agencies, of course, uh, their raison d'etre, especially, for example, the coroners and the college are to be investigating problems like this so what what lessons do you see here 
Well, I think the lessons that we see are that you have to uh, treat uh, the elderly with respect. You have to uh, not just assume that they're old, so they're going to die in long-term care, so we don't need to do anything. If there are issues, you need to bring them to the proper people, to the coroner, the police need to investigate. Um, they need to do those jobs in order to protect the very vulnerable residents that live there. This is, of course, a rare circumstance, but if there were to be someone like uh, Wetlawfer again in, in, in these homes, do you think changes have been made to protect seniors or could this happen again? Well, I think that's what this inquiry is going to look at. And I think that uh, I don't know that changes have been made yet. I think that that's what the whole point of the inquiry is, to make sure that we do make the right changes so that we are protecting all the vulnerable citizens. There's 78,000 of them in Ontario living in long-term care homes. Jane Meadis, thank you very much. Thank you. Let's take a quick look at what else we're working on. Another volcanic explosion and new evacuations in Guatemala tonight as the dangerous search for survivors continues. And the sudden and shocking death of a fashion icon. We'll look at how Kate Spade built an empire that helped change an industry. But first, with just two days until Ontario votes, a bitter family lawsuit is now center stage in the campaign trail. PC leader Doug Ford was pushed to answer questions about the suit filed against him by his own sister-in-law, Renata Ford, the widow of former Toronto mayor Rob Ford. 15 years of taking care of her, both financially, uh, personally, and I, I've bent over backwards, broken down brick walls to take care of Renata. Where this is coming from, you're going to have to ask her. Renata's lawsuit alleges Doug and his brother Randy have conspired together to deprive her and her children financially while running the family business into the ground. Doug Ford's political opponents aren't letting this opportunity pass them by. As the CBC's Hannah Thibodeau tells us, they point to the lawsuit as evidence that Ford cannot be trusted to run the province. Doug Ford launched his leadership bid in his mother's basement, supported by family. Right now... The party needs strong leadership. Now there's a family feud. It's Ford versus Ford. It's heartbreaking uh, that, that Renata's taken this, this road. Renata is the widow of the PC leader's younger brother, Rob Ford. She's suing Doug Ford for $16.5 million, accusing him of withholding money from her and her two children. We're floored. And with... Uh, two days or three days before an election, and I'll let you decide the motive, but uh, we're, we're shocked. The motive he's alluding to is extortion. But in court documents, Renata Ford also alleges that the family company, Deco Labels, lost millions because of mismanagement. The allegations have not been proven in court. Who can you trust with your money? In the campaign, he's repeatedly played himself up as a businessman, the only one who can look after Ontario's economy. Every day, I have to make decisions for a couple hundred families at our company. If this is the credential that he's running on, that he's a businessman, he better be clear about uh, the business. I wouldn't uh, blame people for wondering if, uh, if Doug Ford's not prepared to take care of his own family, how is he going to take care of the families of Ontario? The Fords have experienced a lot of controversy, and this brings back memories of the soap opera that engulfed Toronto City Hall when Doug was a councillor and Rob was the mayor. Doug was Rob's defender after the video of the mayor smoking crack surfaced. I think, uh, you know, this city and this country uh, knows what it's like uh, to have a, a Ford in, in power, and there, there will be some tumult uh, in it, there's, there's no doubt. Some pollsters believe that at this point, the Conservative vote is already baked in, and for many, these type of ethical allegations aren't the main issue in this election. But there are others that say that this is just another chink in the Ford armour that could sway already indecisive voters. Hannah Thibodeau, CBC News, Ottawa. So Renata Ford claims the family business is in bad shape. Well, here's a closer look at those allegations. According to the lawsuit, Deco Labels was worth $10 million when Doug and Rob Ford's father died in 2006 and that the father also had a personal fortune of as much as $20 million. The company is now alleged to have lost about half its value, and the family fortune shrunk to less than $6 million. 
The lawsuit accuses Doug and his other brother, Randy, of trying to, quote, maintain the untrue public appearance of a successful business enterprise. And taking a look at the latest CBC poll tracker, Doug Ford's progressive conservatives have inched ahead of Andrea Horvath's New Democrats in the polls. But despite the close race in the popular vote, our models show that the PCs are still projected to win most seats and to form a majority government. And the man behind the poll tracker is Eric Grenier. So, Eric, let's talk about this lawsuit against Doug Ford. Is it your sense that it could actually have an impact on the election? I think it could. And that's the danger, uh, the danger for the PCs is that it undercuts some of the key messages for Doug Ford. One, that he is a good businessman and he runs his business well and would be able to run the province in the same way that he runs his business. And two, that he's loyal to his family, that he's someone there who's there for the little guy. So there is that danger for him. Doug Ford has become more unpopular as this campaign has worn on. So there's a question of whether this might be the last straw for a lot of voters. A lot of PC voters who might not have been too happy that Doug Ford won that leadership rather than Christine Elliott, but were willing to still back the party whether those people after this will be wondering, is this the kind of thing that we're going to see for the next four years? We'll have to wait and see uh, whether that'll have an impact, but it is very late in the campaign. It, it looks like, from, from watching your work, that the polls have been relatively steady for the past little while. There's not much time left. Is there time for people's minds to change, if you will? It is pretty late in the campaign. A lot of people's votes might already be locked in, and we have seen that there have been the advanced polling, so some people have already voted. But one of the questions about Doug Ford is that, is this kind of thing already baked in? Is this something that people expect to see, that it doesn't surprise them, that they might think that this sort of thing just goes in with the conspiracy uh, against Doug Ford that the party has often talked about? We've seen Doug Ford talk about pollsters and the media mm -hmm. not wanting him to win the election. One of the bigger impacts, though, is probably going to be turnout. If we're going to see a big difference between where the polls are and where the results are, it might just be on who turns out to vote, because the turnout in Ontario elections is usually quite low. Only about half of Ontarians actually go out and cast a ballot. There's a big change in who turns out to vote, particularly if a lot of millennials come out to vote, which would benefit the NDP. Then we might see bigger differences between where the polls are and where the results Results are rather than seeing a difference in the next few days over where people's voting intentions will be. Okay, Eric Grenier, thanks very much. Thank you. And Eric will be here on Thursday night with Rosemary. She's hosting our election night special alongside CBC Toronto's Dwight Drummond. That starts at 8 p.m. Eastern on CBC's new CBC News Network and online. So let's move now to a fight brewing in Ottawa over the inquiry into missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. Andrew? Yeah, Adrian, the tension is over what the federal government is and isn't willing to give. It has agreed to extend the inquiry. Right now, we are in the midst of a historic opportunity. The That's the minister in charge, Carolyn Bennett. She's given the inquiry another six months past the original November 2018 deadline. That gives it until the end of April next year to submit its final report. But commissioners were asking for more. They wanted two more years and about $50 million in new funding to do their work. So, as Catherine Cullen explains, the news today is being met with both relief and frustration. If you're not quite ready, if you haven't been to that place of healing or that place of where you're beginning to, to process and go through that grief, and uh, the window is lost. Josie Niepenak knows it can be hard to open up publicly about a murdered or missing loved one. Her own aunt and cousin were murdered. She says some families are hesitant and haven't yet told their story to the inquiry, but she still thinks a shorter extension is a good idea. I'm not sure that they should get two years, partially because I believe that any resources put forward on should be uh, placed towards family wellness. The inquiry said it needs more time so that hundreds more families can share their stories. But it has also struggled with delays and resignations. The government was asked today if not granting the full two-year extension was a sign of a lack of confidence. No, I think that we are very grateful for the work of the commission in particular. But if the minister wouldn't say she was impatient, she did suggest some provinces are, noting more than one would not sign off on a two-year extension. If any province and territory did not agree to have those extended, we would no longer have a national public inquiry. 
The inquiry also wanted more funding, an additional $50 million. The government did hand out about that much today, but to Indigenous groups and for police oversight, all outside the inquiry. A lot of the families said to us that they would rather the money went um, into the concrete actions to, for seeking of justice, support for families, and, to, and actions to make sure it doesn't happen again. The inquiry's chief commissioner says she's incredibly disappointed. It certainly is going to limit the amount of evidence we can take in, the amount of evidence we can process, and the number of facts we can make findings upon. One commissioner says in light of this decision, she's reflecting on whether or not to keep working with the inquiry. Either way, the final report is now due by April 30th of next year. Catherine Cullen, CBC News, Ottawa. Now, Ottawa won't say how much more money it'll give to the National Inquiry, but it's worth noting today the government did promise millions to address the inquiry's interim recommendations. Now, about $27 million will be given to expand health supports and victim services. This is something families and survivors have been asking for. Ottawa will also follow through on calls to establish a commemoration fund, $10 million, so Indigenous organizations can organize memorial events. Another million or so dollars will fund a review of how police policies and practices affect Indigenous people. And the RCMP will get about nine and a half million dollars for a new unit that will oversee major investigations, including cases of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. Fashion designer Kate Spade seemed to have it all. She built a world famous brand alongside her husband and they were raising a 13 year old daughter. Today, the fashion world was rocked by the news that she took her own life. There was a, uh, a suicide note left at the scene. I'm not going to get into the contents of that note. A housekeeper discovered Spade's body this morning at her Park Avenue apartment. The news setting off shockwaves as her deeply loyal fans grappled with grief and disbelief. Her family said in a statement, we are all devastated by today's tragedy. We loved Kate dearly and will miss her terribly. They also asked for privacy. And that leaves her followers to reflect on her achievement, a success that set her apart in a world built on image. To many women, a Kate Spade handbag wasn't just a fashion statement, but something more personal. The CBC's Tashana Reed found out why. A Midwestern girl with big dreams. Kate Brosnahan was 30, working on a fashion magazine when she took a chance. In 1993, designing six square handbags with her future husband out of her New York City apartment. I remember thinking, there's something missing. I, I want something for my eye to go to. And so the label that was meant to go on the inside, I took it out of the box and I sewed it on the outside and that was it. From there, Kate Spade, the brand, was born. Soon, Hollywood's biggest stars of the 90s had her bags in tow. Her innovation and whimsical style fueled an empire. In 2006, Spade sold her company for millions. Today, it's worth billions. She made luxury both accessible yet aspirational, and that can be a delicate balance. She was able to create things that were playful yet sophisticated, simple yet very stylish. Her image still firmly attached to the brand. She left the industry in 2006, yet even to this day, you're right, people still think she's behind it. So I think it really speaks to the power of her spirit that she has imbued in that DNA. More than 315 stores around the world now bear her name. News of her death came as a shock to longtime customers. Well, I'm old enough to remember when Kate Spade came on the scene, um, and she was an innovative designer, and she had a very whimsical side. Everything is so unique. You walk in, there's like a bag that looks like a slice of lemon. It just, it makes you happy to walk into her store. Fashion journalist Jeannie Becker interviewed Kate Spade several times over the years. She understood the power um, of fashion and style to, to uplift us and to just make us uh, feel better about ourselves and about the human condition. That only makes her final act more difficult to comprehend. Kate Spade was 55. Tashana Reed, CBC News, Toronto. Ahead tonight on The National, a bit of a makeover for the Miss America pageant as it gives a nod to the Times and scraps that swimsuit competition. Also, a new eruption in Guatemala renews panic on the ground. What could be next for the thousands who've been forced from their homes?
And Gloria Allred, the crusading lawyer, speaks to Rosemary about the moment that helped make her a fierce champion for women. And he opened the door, and I walked into the room, and it was empty, and I turned around, and he had a gun pointed at me. Tonight on The National, we're keeping a close watch on Guatemala because there's been another explosive eruption from the Fuego volcano, just as new evacuation orders were issued for the surrounding area. People are also gathering for the first funerals for victims of Sunday's blast. The death count right now at 72. Their cries cut through a central square near the volcano, their grief etched onto their faces. These are the families of seven people killed by Fuego. The dead lay side by side. On top are baskets to collect money for families. This is a scene that will repeat itself as more bodies are found, victims identified. But that too is proving difficult. Some of the bodies are unrecognizable. People overrun by a superheated cloud of debris. You can imagine that traveling as a glowing cloud sucking in all the atmospheric air around it. If that hits you, you end up sucking that glowing cloud into your lungs. The work of first responders, too, has become dangerous. Every move, every operation itself presenting a new risk. The soil is very unstable and um, it's very, very difficult to breathe. But it's scenes like this that give them hope. A baby pulled from the debris of a home, seemingly alert and unharmed, though it's not clear what became of her parents. Almost 2,000 people are now in shelters, many awaiting news of their loved ones and fearful of what Fuego has in store next. The pressure builds, we get these explosions that we're seeing, and then eventually it, it calms down and we go back into a period of kind of quiescence. But when that will be is, is really, really difficult to say. Fuego is still rattling with about eight to 10 eruptions every hour. And here's the other volcano we're watching on Hawaii's Big Island. Kilauea has been erupting for more than a month, but in the last 24 hours, a huge destructive shift Officials say overnight, hundreds of homes were destroyed by a river of lava. It's like a flood, you know. It's just pouring out, covering everything in its path. Uh, just incredible what it's doing. Um, it looked like there's no stopping it. The hundreds of houses destroyed last night are on top of the 117 homes already wiped out. Also lost today, Kapoho Bay. That's an area known for its snorkeling and tidal pools, but now it's gone, completely filled in by lava. Still to come on The National, we're going to revisit the rubble of Raqqa with a new report that calls what happened there a potential war crime, and it's not talking about ISIS. But first, though, Gloria Allred, the tough attorney and feminist, talks to Rosie about fighting for the right to be heard. When people say that about you, oh, you're in it for you, you're in it for money, what do you, what do you say to them? I'm in it for justice. We begin our fight now. Uh, we will fight this case in the courtroom. Harvey Weinstein's high-profile lawyer signaled today that he's ready for battle as the disgraced Hollywood mogul appeared in court. Weinstein pleaded not guilty to two counts of rape and a criminal sex act. Mr. Weinstein has uh, denied uh, these crimes. He has maintained that he has never engaged in non-consensual sex with anyone. Benjamin Broffman is known for famous clients, powerful men like Michael Jackson and the rapper Sean Combs, also known as Puff Daddy. When a hotel maid accused the former head of the International Monetary Fund of sexual assault, he turned to Broffman. But another big-name lawyer has a hand in this case. Gloria Allred rose to fame as a champion of women. She gave them a platform for accusing powerful men of treating them like prey. Rosie met her at the Los Angeles office where Allred has taken aim at giants and sometimes brought them down. 
There is breaking news in Bill Cosby's sexual assault. A assaults, Pennsylvania retrial. jury has convicted Bill Cosby the of sexual assault. The jury has found actor Bill Cosby Constant. guilty on all counts now, of sexual Bill Cosby assault. Has been found guilty. We don't get anything for women. We don't achieve anything unless we are powerful and understand our own power. But we have to be really tough. I want to show our viewers some uh, uh, dramatic video that we uh, just got in uh, a Upon little while Upon reading of the first guilty verdict, several of Cosby's alleged prior victims shrieked and shook with joy. We've got a guilty verdict now. What do you think? We have a tsunami, baby. I was so overwhelmed with emotion. I just want to hug them. Right I will go away when there is justice for my client. But until there's justice, Gloria, Gloria. I will be relentless in the pursuit of justice Gloria, hold on a second. because they deserve it. Women were finally believed, and we thank the jury so much for that. Bill Cosby, three words for you. Guilty, guilty, guilty. guilty. Thank you. Let me see if I can get you an attorney to speak with you. All red, Moroccan Gilbert. Hello. <laughs> How are you? Good. Very nice to meet nice you. Nice to meet you, Ms. Allred. Okay. Please, you're gonna be right here. All right, thank you. I want to now bring in attorney Gloria Allred. She represents 29 women who he claim Bill Cosby sexually assaulted them. He did give quaaludes uh, to some women with intent to have sex, More although important is whether he's going to testify under oath. Uh, and not by a tweet in the middle of the night from the bedroom in the White House. There's lots of things that critics say about you. Self-promoter, grandstander, media manipulator, mm -hmm. sensationalist. Do you understand why people try to label you that way? And well, of course, you? there are many people who would like women to be silenced, and they're very, very disturbed by the fact that I help individuals who are not celebrities, who allege that they have been victimized by celebrities, to be heard. Mm -hmm. And there are people who don't like that because for some reason they may think that only celebrities matter and maybe they just like th the sound of men's voices i don't know or maybe there's some other reason but women's voices matter five four three good we have two women gloria already her daughter who have created this campaign this smear campaign against mr Cosby. my better question for you is what did Gloria Allred promise these women? And Ms. Allred, what about the Netflix documentaries? Tell me about those bar claims that you're facing right now in California. Address that. Why are you here disrupting? I am not disrupting? facing any bar investigations whatsoever. You're not? No. I felt like you liked those moments. You, you live a little bit for those moments. You, you obviously like debating. You like that back and forth. I'm not adverse to <laughs> challenging someone who is an opponent on what he said. Explain, well, explain to me this, Ms. Okay, Why no, did wait, you ask for $100 Sydney, million? I, I'm dollars. going to respond. Oh, I'm so glad you asked. Why did you ask for $100 million? And, and you, but you need to Please listen. Don't and don't I believe that those who do not have a close relationship with the truth need to be challenged because truth matters. No, 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 you do your own press conference. Thank you, guys. Because you don't want to hear that. You want to come over to my press conference and you go, did I disrupt you? Did I disrupt you? Did I disrupt you? Did I disrupt you? I'm not intimidated by them. I know what is right. I know what the truth is. And I'm not going to stand there and allow any of my clients to be defamed or to be discussed in a way that is not truthful. It's so tiny. You cram a lot of people. I cram a lot of people in here. And you typically sit here at this uh -huh. end? And you don't, you don't say much, you just sit there. And, yeah. yeah, well often they insist that they're not going to cry. They don't want to cry. Yeah. They just want to say what they have to say. Yeah. But they often end up crying. Sure. Because it all comes welling out of them. I did 
the right thing for Andrea Constant. And for myself, his behavior was like that of a predator. I will continue to speak the truth and I refuse to be intimidated into silence. He laid next to me on the bed and began. They're in front of all those cameras, the whole world, recounting unpleasant, painful, traumatic things. Why do you think so many of them do that? Put because they want their voices to be heard. Yeah. And many women have decided they don't wish to suffer in silence. And they know the risk, and they were willing to take the risk. I think a lot of people associate you with cases against celebrities, and they assume you're making tons of money, and that's why you're in it. But when you read your book, you realize the breadth of people that you have represented. Mm -hmm. People from farm workers to prostitutes yes. mm -hmm. to dry cleaning people to... Right. So w when people say that about you, oh, you're in it for you, you're in it for money, what do you, what do you say to them? I'm in it for justice. And I don't think that my clients should have to choose between principles and being compensated for the harm that they've suffered. Hmm. Men don't have to make that choice. They can have both principles and the money. I don't have any apology to make for the fact that we are successful, that we've won hundreds of millions of dollars for victims, and we intend to continue on that path. I'm attorney Gloria Allred, and I'm here today to today urge the I'm public. Today I'm able to confirm that I will act as her attorney. Today we are here with I'm yet another Gloria woman. Today I'm here with two of my clients right, Thank you very much for coming Jamie. today. Can, can you describe the, the event that happened when you went to Mexico, the thing that I guess must have changed you in some way? I met a doctor who asked me out on a date, and I agreed to go to dinner with him. And he said, well, first, if you don't mind, I need to stop at the hospital and see some patients, make sure they're doing okay. I said, fine, I'll, I'll go with you. And so we did. And then after that, he said, well, I have one more stop. I have some patients who are no longer in the hospital. They're in a hotel. I need to go there just to check on them and see how they're doing as they're recuperating. I said, OK. And he opened the door. And I walked into the room, and it was empty. And I turned around, and he had a gun pointed at me. And after that, he raped me. And I was in complete shock. I still am to this day. Mm -hmm. In any event, after I left Mexico and then returned to the United States, then I became pregnant. And then I had a decision to make. And ultimately, I got an abortion. It was not a crime for me to have it, but it was a crime for anyone to perform it upon me. Mm -hmm. I hemorrhaged, and I went to the hospital. I almost died. I had to be packed in ice. I had 106-degree fever. And then a nurse said to me, I hope this teaches you a lesson. I still don't know what lesson she thought she hoped that it would teach me, because the only thing I learned from it is that it is wrong and dangerous to the lives and health of women for abortion to be illegal, unsafe, unaffordable, unavailable. Is it hard for you to tell that story? <clears throat> you say you're still in shock about it. Many women feared talking about the fact they had an abortion. There yeah. was a stigma. But I felt that I needed to be truthful. And so I shared that, and that was it. Because a woman shouldn't have to be ashamed. I'm here today with yet another victim of Harvey Weinstein. Her name is Natasha Malta. I was sitting on the bed talking to Harvey when he pushed me back and forced himself onto me. It was not consensual. I laid still and closed my eyes and just wanted it to end. I played dead. 
I believed in the Cinderella story. I thought I, I am supposed to look for this guy that is the prince, and then by the age of 26, I'll have babies with him and marry. And, he'll, <laughs> and you'll live happily ever after. Exactly what I thought. But it's a fairy tale. It's not the reality. And, and what we say in the women's movement, you need to become the person you wanted to marry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you wanted to marry someone who would take care of you and protect you, you need to take care of yourself and protect yourself. Mm -hmm. For many of my clients, for example, they've come in with little girls' voices that are just kind of trapped in their little girls. And they're adult women. Mm -hmm. And once they become empowered, they learn their rights, they learn how to assert their rights, they become vindicated when they have asserted their rights. They're rewarded for asserting their rights. Sometimes that little girl voice <laughs> turns into a full adult woman's voice. We now have Harvey Weinstein, who I know you're representing one of his accusers, Bill Cosby, Kevin Spacey. I mean, the list is longer than we could have imagined. What has happened, do you think, that this has all started to unfold in this way? Well, women have just been sick and tired of being sick and tired of being silenced. And they've decided they want to speak out. And they are feeling that if I speak out, it might help other women because there may be other victims of that same perpetrator. Mm -hmm. And accountability and wanting accountability from perpetrators of rape or sexual assault or sexual harassment is contagious. Is your work ever over? No. And it will never be over in my lifetime because women are not equal yet with men. We're not there politically, economically, socially, legally. We have a long way to go. The fight has just begun. <laughs> and no surprise, Gloria Allred is taking aim at another bastion of male power by representing five former NFL cheerleaders. They're suing the Houston Texans, accusing the team of unfair treatment and intimidation. There is more ahead tonight on The National. First, though, Miss America is the grand dam of the beauty pageant industry, and it's just announced a revolutionary change. Miss America is doing away with the time-honored swimsuit competition. The 2018 pageant tees a bikini gone in a puff of smoke. The new Miss America will be about what's on the inside. But this is a massive shift from the spectacle that brought audiences to the pageant for nearly a century. To inaugurate this pageant, a boardwalk parade, enabling judges and crowd alike to spend a full two minutes studying each of the four dozen fulsome entries. The swimsuit competition is tradition. This is how Miss America started. It was a bathing beauties contest on the boardwalk in Atlantic City. Uh, but it was a gimmick. It was an, an opportunity to uh, generate more tourism for Atlantic City post-Labor Day. Mallory Hagen was Miss America 2013. I wish I would have spent more time learning about how I could be a better uh, steward to the community and create more change in the community. And I would love to see the contestants in the Miss America competition focused more on that and less on the hours that they're spending in the gym. Criticism of the swimsuit competition has been going on since the 60s. The pageant evolved. The first black Miss America in 1984, the first South Asian Miss America in 2014. Body diversity? No sign of it, but a scandal last year revealed a toxic culture of sexism and bullying emanating from the pageant's then CEO, leading to his resignation and a kind of takeover by former pageant winners. We now have four former Miss Americas on the board of directors, and we have former state title holders at the helm of the organization. That includes Gretchen Carlson, Miss America 1989, and longtime anchor at the conservative Fox News instrumental in doing away with the swimsuits. Mallory Hagan, meanwhile, is busy with politics. Tonight, she is running in a Democratic congressional primary in Alabama, a sign, perhaps, that the swimsuit competition has blinded the public to what the competition was always really about, exemplary people.
Rubble and dust and little else. This is what we saw in Raqqa, Syria last fall after U.S. airstrikes rained from above, driving ISIS out. To many, those airstrikes helped liberate the city, but today Amnesty International described them differently, a potential war crime, indiscriminate bombing that it says killed many civilians. It was four months last year of relentless pounding from airstrikes and artillery that turned Raqqa to rubble. Yes, the U.S.-led coalition operation ended the reign of ISIS there, but while American commanders boasted loudly of the most precise campaign in the history of armed conflict, the dust of Raqqa said something different. Amnesty International now says several of those coalition strikes violated international law that not nearly enough care was taken to protect civilians. They fired 30,000 artillery shells into Raqqa. Uh, that's tantamount to indiscriminate strikes. Amnesty did its research in February of this year, but a few months earlier, in the days just after ISIS had been routed, we got to look for ourselves. <laughs> The stench and flies told of bodies buried in the rubble, the danger too high to count them because of all the mines. The city littered with unexploded ordnance. This woman found herself in the basement of a building bombed by the coalition, trying to protect orphaned kids. <laughs> This family, the Badruns, lost 39 members in four separate airstrikes, were constantly moving to avoid them. Everyone in this video eventually killed by a strike just a few days after these pictures were taken. For a sense of scale, at one point, the Syrian Observatory for Human Rights tried to calculate the munitions dropped in Raqqa and determined that in one month alone, it was one every eight minutes. And what seems to worry Amnesty is it doesn't have a sense of the procedures the Americans in particular use to protect civilians, many who were being used as human shields. <laughs> Kurdish soldiers on the ground boasted at the time about how quickly Americans responded to requests for airstrikes. <laughs> A detail that emboldens a fighting force but panics a human rights organization. The Americans, though, aren't taking Amnesty's report well, accuse the group of just being wrong. They're literally judging us guilty until proven innocent. That's a bold rhetorical move by an organization that fails to check the public record or consult the accused. So among the recommendations from Amnesty that the coalition has to disclose enough information about those strikes to make sure there weren't actually violations of international humanitarian law, and if there were, then they're going to have to pay reparations. But an important point that you touched on there, the Americans don't accept these findings. No, they don't. Uh, they're looking into some of them, and they're also... They're well aware that Amnesty is saying to them that, look, you also have to do more to rebuild Raqqa, more reconstruction, more demining, because the place is a mess. All right, thanks. And we do want to remind you to subscribe to our newsletter. The National Today sheds a light on stories you may have missed. Today it was the man who hopes to be the first to swim across the Pacific, the dangers he'll face, and how he's becoming a sort of guinea pig for science. You can subscribe at cbcnews.ca slash the national. These are two young men. 16 and 17 year old that are now victims of homicide. Um, I hope the community uh, takes note of that and how serious this is. Tonight on the National Police in BC are trying to figure out who killed two teen boys in a targeted shooting. Their bodies were found last night on a road in Surrey. The city southeast of Vancouver has long struggled with gang violence. Also found near the scene two burned out vehicles Police say the two discoveries could be connected. As for the victims, both were high school students known to each other, but not to police. And one of the passengers hurt in that tour bus crash in Ontario has died of his injuries. The 54-year-old was one of 35 Chinese tourists on the bus at the time. Of the others sent to hospital, five are still in serious condition tonight. Police say they're still trying to figure out what caused that bus to veer off the highway, slamming into a wall of rock.
Donald Trump was supposed to hold a party today for the Super Bowl champs, but the majority of the Philadelphia Eagles said they wouldn't be able to make it. Trump, though, didn't let that get in the way of a celebration. Instead, he hosted a celebration of the national anthem and the American flag. He made no mention of the Eagles or the other NFL players who protested police brutality by kneeling. But he did talk about the importance of standing for the anthem and the action of one man kneeling in the crowd at the White House is our moment of the day. We love our country. We respect our flag. And we always proudly stand for the national anthem. We always will stand for the national anthem. And to be clear, it's not just one man or even one football team that Trump is dealing with. Listen to the most dominant basketball player in the world, LeBron James, talking today about the president and whether the winner of the NBA Finals, his team or their opponent, will go to the White House. It's typical of him. I mean, I'm not surprised. Um, I'm just, you know, typical of him. And um, I don't know. I mean... I mean, I know no matter who wins this series, no, one's, no one wants to invite anyway, so it won't be Golden State or Cleveland going. And, of course, the context here, this isn't the first dust-up that Trump has had with LeBron James or the Golden State Warriors, for that matter. Uh, it was back in September. Trump famously withdrew the invitation for the Golden State Warriors to visit the White House after they won the championship, and he called Steph Curry out by name. LeBron James jumped to his defense, calling Trump a bum. And, while well, the rest is history. It goes on and on and yeah. on. Well, politics and patriotism in the U.S. are something else. Again, it's interesting looking at the Eagles, though, because it, it appears that in 2017, not one of the Eagles was kneeling for the anthem, and yet there's been a new spat, Fox News running pictures of Eagles players kneeling and chastising them and then learning, oops, they were praying and they had to apologize. It's messy, messy. Anyway, that is The National for June the 5th. Good night. Good night. Good night.